I'd like to welcome everyone to Westside Church of Christ today. And uh, if you've never heard that before, it's a pretty powerful song. And uh, we're in a series right now called Right, Wrong, and Different. Why we do the things we do here at Westside on a Sunday morning. And just because it's different than the way things were done 2,000 years ago or even 10 years ago, it doesn't make it wrong. So uh, two weeks ago, we started out this series, and we called it a Worship Sunday. And with that, we looked at worship. What does God really want from us concerning when we sing to him? And we looked at John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and how she uh, was approached by Jesus, and, and Jesus informed her that he wants uh, worshipers that worship God in spirit and in truth, worship that comes from the heart. And that she was wanting Jesus to uh, finalize an argument where the proper place of worship was in Samaria or in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, well, we're not getting into that. What God wants is those that worship in spirit and in truth. So our worship needs to come from inside, from the heart. And we talked about how everything we talk about during this series, there's a common thread which it all involves the motivations of our heart and where our heart really is at. And we also studied the Psalms and looked at the fact that God loves a variety of different kinds of worship. And we looked at worship is singing, but worship is also shouting praise. And you can shout to the Lord in a loud voice. We looked at how God said clapping of hands was giving God praise and worship. We looked at the playing of musical instruments is worship to God. That's not just something that accompanies our worship, but those that play skillfully are actually giving over worship to the Lord. And finally, we looked at dancing and how even dancing was looked at in the Old Testament as a form of worship before God. So all of these things uh, encompass worship. And last week, we moved from worship and we studied communion, and we called it Communion Sunday. And we looked at how 2,000 years ago, when they would take communion, when Jesus first implemented communion, they were eating a feast, just like uh, uh, we would gather together for our community meals uh, the fourth Sunday of the month. That is what the early church did every week to celebrate communion. They would have this big community meal together, and as they ate, they would partake in communion. And we looked at how Jesus implemented communion at Passover, and that Jesus was our Passover lamb. And in Passover, they were celebrating their exodus from Egypt, and how the last plague that brought on Egypt was the death of the firstborn. And God instructed Moses to inform the Israelites that they were to kill a spotless lamb. And not just kill it for anything, they were going to eat it, but they were going to take the blood of that spotless lamb and put it on the door po doorpost, the sides of the door and the top of the door. And when the death angel came through that night, he would pass over their house because they were protected by the blood of the Lamb. And we saw how Jesus was called our Passover Lamb in the New Testament, meaning we're covered by Christ's blood. And when we come face to face with God, it's his blood that protects us. And, uh, and we will be passed over uh, for, for the penalty of what, of what our sins are. So Jesus is our Passover Lamb. We looked at the big three reasons why we take communion. We talked last week about how we remember forward. We remember forward. We're not only remembering his death, but we also are proclaiming that he is coming again in the future. And I said, if you don't believe that Jesus is coming back for the church, probably shouldn't be taking communion because that's the statement we're making is that we are, we are proclaiming his, his uh, second coming when we take communion. The other thing we need to do is examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. We looked at how a, a church in Corinth uh, was having a community meal, and the rich people would bring mostly all of the food, and they got tired of it. They didn't want to supply the, the food for, for the poor people in the area that couldn't buy And so what would happen, they were gluttoning them, getting drunk from this community meal, leaving no food or wine for communion for the, the poor people that would be at work all day. So they were neglecting their responsibility to take care of other people in their church and to allow communion to to. To, to, to be partaken by everybody in the congregation. So Paul said we need to examine ourselves. What's our motivating factors for taking communion? And that is something that needs to be done each and every week by, by, by you and I. We, I. we need to be examining ourselves. Wh wh where's our relationship with God at? Is there, a, is there a sin 
that is, uh, that is hindering my relationship with Jesus Christ, and I need to repent of that sin. So that's an important time of communion. Communion is never meant to be a religious duty that we just do. If it was a religious duty, you're not taking it with the right motivation. You need to be taking it because you're trying to connect with God, to strengthen your relationship with God. And finally, the third reason we look that we take communion is that it's an outward statement of our unity. It's an outward statement of our unity. That's why some churches will pass the, the bread and the cup and then wait until everyone's been served, and then together you will take the bread and the cup as one to signify that you are unified through your faith in Christ. And even though we don't do that here, that's still okay. We do it differently. And we're still proclaiming that we are unified when we take communion. And this week we've called it Communication Sunday. This week is Communication Sunday. And uh, have you ever thought that communication is a vital part of worship service? Because it's a, it's a huge part of the worship service on Sunday morning. Each Sunday we pray and each Sunday, we read God's word and we listen to someone deliver a message. There's some communication going on between us and the Lord. And that's why I've called it Communication Sunday. After all, we're not gathered here to listen to someone preach. If you're here because of me, or, or if you're attending a church because of who the minister is, you're attending for the wrong reason. If you're attending because you like to hear Tony sing, and I like to hear Tony sing, but that's not why I show up in the morning, you're attending for the wrong reasons. We're here to meet relationally with the Father, and that's why we're here. We're gathered to communicate with God and to hear what he wants to communicate to us. That's why we're here, and that's what, that's what we're going to look at today, a very basic message on prayer and basically preaching, why, why we do it the way we do it and the importance of communicating with God and with um, with him communicating to us. And in Acts 2.42, it says this uh, from the earliest of, of church records that we have. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This early church was right after Peter preached at Pentecost, the first sermon ever preached. 3,000 people believed and were baptized there in Acts chapter 2. And then they all went, and they were all gathered in Jerusalem for for for. for for the well, basically, for, for, this, for this event, and then they were all going to go back to their own places. So if you thought the church started with the church of just 3,000 people that met, that's not really the right interpretation. They all went back to their own homes, their own areas, and, and they all met together in, in their own homes, basically is where they would meet. And those are the four things that the early church would be, um, what they would do. They would meet to pray, they would meet to listen to the apostles' teaching, they would meet for fellowship, and they would meet for the breaking of bread. And that, that, that encompasses worship and communion. So that is what we want to be dedicated to. That is what we want to, to, to have as a part of our service every week. We want to have that because we want to be like the early church because they, they knew exactly what the apostles wanted, and the apostles knew exactly what Jesus wanted for the church. So that's what we want to be modeled after. Now, after, we, uh, after I'm done with this sermon on prayer and God's word, um, I do know that, that you're going to say, well, I didn't really learn anything new there. I already knew all of that. I want to the impactful part of the message today is not what you hear from me, but it's what you do the other six days of the week with what I tell you God wants. If you don't do these things the other six days of the week, like, you're really going to be disconnected from God. So I really want to encourage you that yeah, it's going to be very surface level today. There's not going to be anything new that you're going to learn, but what you do learn, I really want to make sure you apply to your life. Now, now, prayer is the primary way we communicate to God. And I know that there are other ways that we can communicate to God, but prayer is the primary way that God wants us to communicate to him. And God's word, the reading of God's word, not just on Sunday morning, but as much as you can read it, is the way God communicates to us. Now, there are other ways that God can communicate to us, but the primary way that he wants to communicate to us is through his written word. So let's, so let's get started here with prayer. Prayer is my first point. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Now as we, now as we look at this aspect of prayer, I was thinking about how, how do I want to introduce it? So I, I was thinking about maybe uh, a movie clip of, some, of, uh, of someone praying and, and looking at that, and then I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And then and I was thinking, well, there's a lot of good books on prayer. There's a lot of good books on prayer. There, there's, there's books in our library right now on prayer that you can read and you can get 
a, a lot from that book. It can strengthen and deepen your prayer life. I have a book up here that, that I highly recommend for us in America. It's called Too Busy Not to Pray by Bill Hybels. I've read it twice. I'm not a big reader, so if I've read a book twice, it definitely impacted my life. It's Too Busy Not to Pray. So if you're like, look, I'm just too busy to pray, I, I'll give you this book after the service. I haven't actually marked in this book or anything, so uh, it, it'll just be a, a good tool for you to have to understand that no matter how busy you think you are, you have time to be praying and you need to be in communication with God. But I thought, you know, I don't want to use a book as an outline or, or anything like that. I, w- I want to do something radical today. I want to do something that, 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 that is going to shock you. So I don't, wa- I don't want anyone to leave when I say what I'm about to say. But, but just, just listen to me. This is radical. What I'm going to do today is use the very words of Jesus and what he wants for us concerning prayer. Is that okay? Can we use the words of Jesus? I mean, I understand that authors can have a deep perspective on prayer, but who has the best perspective on prayer? That'd be Jesus Christ, okay? So that's what we're going to use today are his words alone to teach us what we need to do concerning prayer. And in your bulletins, we have a verse there of Luke 11, 1. And it says, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Now, I think it's very interesting that they are looking and listening to Jesus praying, and then they go, we want to pray like that. Now, the reason they said that is because the prayers that they would hear in the synagogue or, or, or in, the, in, 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 in the temple or from their religious leaders was way different from the kinds of prayer that they heard uh, Jesus, Jesus giving here. It, it, was, it was like two different worlds. And, and Jesus, according to Luke, moves into the, the Lord's Prayer after that. Not, not the full one, but Luke just records an abbreviated version of the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is a good model for prayer. It was never meant to be a recipe that we have to follow or a prayer that we have to recite. It was, it was kind of a model for us to, to know what prayer needs to include. It needs to include adoration, which means we, 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 we glorify God. It needs to include uh, supplication, which means we, we need to be praying for our own needs. You know, give us this day our daily bread. It needs to include confession. We need to be confessing our sins to the Lord. It includes submission, understanding that we want the Lord's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only part that wasn't there was thanksgiving, which is another key part of prayer. And I, and I love that, but that's exactly what I want today. I don't want to study the Lord's Prayer today. We all know the Lord's Prayer. What I want to study is in Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. There's this little lead-up that Matthew gives that Jesus records before he gives the Lord's Prayer. And it, it's pretty important because he gives this kind of do, do not, kind of aspect of prayer what he wants for us when we pray so this is what i want to look at today in verse five it says and when you pray and when you pray do not do not be like the hypocrites for they pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others truly i tell you they have received their reward in full but when you pray but when you pray go to your room close the door and pray to your father who is unseen then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So Jesus makes some pretty simple suggestions about prayer right here. He's also calling out the religious leaders of the day. You may say, well, that doesn't say anything about the religious leaders. Well, hypocrite is referring to the religious leaders. He's calling them hypocrites. If you've Read the Gospels, you know Jesus calls the religious leaders a lot of bad things, a lot of bad things, and hypocrites are one of the things that he calls them. And the reason he calls them out is they were looked at as the uh, is exemplary example of, of prayer, what you need to be doing when you pray. And they're out in public doing this, and he's saying they're hypocrites. Don't be like them. Don't be like them. Now he also says we shouldn't go on babbling Basically, with thoughtless, repeated words. That's what babble means, just thoughtless, repeated words to think that we are going to be heard, okay? That's not what Jesus wants from us when we pray. So let's get to the simple truth that Jesus is trying to teach the disciples and you and me. What is Jesus trying to teach us? First, I want to say this. Jesus is not against public prayer. 
Some people can look at that and say, well, Jesus must not, must not want us to pray in public. No, that's not, what, that's, not what he's, that's not what he's saying. And the reason I know that is because Jesus himself prayed in public. Jesus himself prayed in public. So we know that he's not against public prayer. So what is he really against? And I want us to take note of this. He's against prayer that preaches to the hearers. He is against prayer that preaches to the hearers. He is against prayers that put other people down. And he is against prayers that try to elevate the person praying. So the Pharisees, Sadducees, religious leaders would, would always pray, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this other group of people over here. Lord, I give 10% of everything I get. God, I have been praying for an hour here, and I want everybody to know that I've been praying for an hour here. I want everyone to know how religious I am and how good I am. That, that, that is not what he wants concerning prayer in public. That, that is not what it is. And Jesus also is not against repetition in our prayer life. For example, if I'm praying for someone to come to know the Lord, is he against me praying day after day after day after day for them to come to know the Lord? Not at all. That's not, that's not what he is against. And he's definitely not against lengthy, long prayers, okay? He's not saying your prayer life has to be a short, uh, 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 you know, right in the box, just make it two minutes and be done with me. I'm God, I have other things to do. That's not what he's saying at all. And the reason we know that is in, um, is in Luke 6, verse 12, Jesus says this, on one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And get this, then he spent the night praying to God. So, so we know that he spent the night praying to God. Tommy, did you get that? You should come in here, Tommy. Come on, because you're really distracting me out there. Please come in here. He spent the night praying to God. Come on, Tommy, I'm, I'm being serious. This is like four or five times I just keep glancing back there at you. Could you please come in here? Thank you. So he spent the night praying to God. Jesus wants us not to babble. Jesus wants to babble. So he, he doesn't want us to recite, maybe memorize prayers over and over and over again without thinking about what we're actually saying. Or back then, pagans thought that if they just said a lot of words, that somehow a God would hear them and then answer their prayers. And Jesus is saying, you don't need, just need to babble on and on and on and on to for God to hear you. He, he, knows what you, he knows what's on your heart already. And, that, and that's what I want to get at here, is that Jesus is addressing the motives of our hearts, both privately and we privately. Jesus is concerned about the motives of our hearts. That thing that we talk about each and every week during this series is the motives of our heart. He cares about the motives of our heart when we worship, when we take communion, and when we pray. He cares about the motives of of our hearts and we need to be going to god in prayer with the right motives of our heart we need to know what what god wants and and and, and what's really important to us and we need to connect with god through prayer so our hearts are right with him so why do we pray during the worship service that's what we're talking about here why, why, why do we pray what, what's the point why does tony bother opening up in prayer we're already communicating to god through worship. So why bother communicating to God through prayer? What's the point? Why do we pray before communion, before offering, after the message? John, that's a lot of prayers. What are we doing here? Well, we're, 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 we're about getting centered on our focus, getting centered on our relationship with God. That's why we pray. That's why we pray to start out the service. So everything else we talked about in the lobby, like, like John's awesome Hawaiian shirt on a 29 degree day, about the Notre Dame football game watch and Tony said how great it was that Notre Dame football games started at 12 o'clock. Every game should be at 12 so you can take a nap by 3 and get to bed by 8. It's great, right? right? All those kind of conversations that go on in the hallway there, that's fine, you know, especially if you want to compliment me on my clothing. That's totally fine. When we come into here, we need to leave that stuff out there. And our focus needs to be on God who we're really coming here to meet with. That's why we pray to make sure our hearts are right with him and our focus is on him when we worship. That is why we pray after we give a community meditation so our hearts, then our focus on God, who we are remembering in that time. That is why we pray after we do an offering meditation so when we give, 
We're not giving reluctantly, under compulsion, or, or just throwing whatever is in the offering plate, but our hearts are right with the Lord. We're focused on him. That's why we pray after m- my message, so that way we are thinking about what God taught us, not what I said, but the scripture that we actually read that day hopefully penetrates your heart. And finally, why do we read prayer requests at the end of the service? Why, why do we do that? You know, Tony, in the, in, in the beginning, said, you know, we can cast all of our cares on him. I don't know if you knew this, but we were going to look at that verse again, 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your anxiety, or, or some of your Bibles say, all of your cares on him, because he cares for you. And we looked at that verse in the I Love Sundays feature, where, where the imagery is, is like a fish, is like, is like fishing. You know, you put your anxieties on the line, and then you just cast it out to the Lord and let him take care of it. And when we come together, we, we, we have an opportunity to, to write down prayer requests, and we read those aloud for, for, for a common good, for everyone to be hopefully praying for those things during the week and giving them over to the Lord. And, and, and it, it involves the, the entire congregation. This is where we can grow relationally when we're praying for one another. The most loving thing you can do for someone is pray for them. I truly do believe that. For a brother in Christ, the most loving thing you can do for someone is to be praying for them. So when we read those prayers, be thinking about some of those to be praying about during the week. Maybe God will move in your spirit to, to say, look, oh man, that person in the hospital, I, I want you to pray for them every day this week. It can be a powerful thing because when we're praying as a congregation for certain things and those prayers are answered, it, it, it leaves a dynamic impact on our faith. So it's very important that we pray in that way. And then I always pray when I, when I, that I lift them up to the Lord and that his will will be done. Now, why, why would I say that? God, your will be done. Well, it's, it's this understanding that we're giving everything over to God because he's sovereign. He's really in control. Did you know God has a will? We have free will. God has free will too. And God's free will trumps our free will. God gets to do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, why he wants to do it. It's all about him. So when we give our requests over to God and say, God, your will be done, we're admitting that he is sovereign, that he is in control, that he has a sense of wisdom and power to do what really needs to be done, and that releases our anxiety because we know that everything is in his control. It's very important. Prayer is the way we communicate to God, and we want to make sure that he is communicating to us on Sundays as well, not just us communicating to him, but we need to make sure that he is communicating to us, and the Bible is how God communicates to us. Now, in today's church, and even 2,000 years ago, there were people twisting and changing what the disciple or what the apostles taught. There was false teaching going on rampantly in the early church. The, there still is false teaching going on in today's church. And what I like about the leadership here at Westside is they never want us to stray from God's word. They never want us to change God's word. They want everything to be preached that is in God's word without apology because those are God's words to us. And even though those words go counter to what popular culture says, I still make no apologies. I will not be changing any of the scriptures to be popular with what culture wants us to accept or to believe. That's, that, that, that's just the way it is. We, you can clap. That's good. That's, th- that's a form of worship. That's, that's, that's what we need to know is that we will never compromise the message of the word of God, the message of the gospel. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, that is a, that, that is a crazy thing to think about because that, that's not inclusive. That's not tolerant. That's not loving John. He's saying he's the only way? Yes, the only way to God. And I would never, ever compromise that simple message of the gospel and of what God really wants from us and how he wants us to live. So every Sunday morning, we, we need to come together and listen to what God has for us because it's important. You know, Psalm 119, 105 says this. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. I think Amy Grant sang a song many years ago, said something like that. But those words are actually from God, not Amy Grant. Do you guys ever think about that verse, though? What does that actually mean? Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. You think how important that is for us? See, we live in a dark world, a very, very dark world that wants us to compromise, wants us to give into our flesh every second we can. And God says, no, 
Let me tell you something. My word is a lamp. My word will give light to that darkness, to the world, so you know how to walk, where to walk. You will see the dangers that are out there. God's word is a light for us. It is very important that we know it and that we do it. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Get this. It judges, we don't like judging, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in your heart is hidden from God. If you think, oh, God doesn't know about this in my heart, what I'm thinking about someone else or the sin that no one else knows about, God knows about that. And the word points those sins out. And when it says the Bible is alive and active, I love that because it is so true. Every time I read the word, every time I go, go to the word to study, it's alive. It, 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 it gives me reason to live each day. It gives my life direction. And there are times where it is very convicting, where my heart goes, oh, man, God, I am, whoa, I am way off base. I need to course correct here. It is alive and active. It, it, it's 2,000 years old, but it's just as alive and active as it was when it was first written, at least the New Testament 2,000 years old. So that, that is so important that God wants us to be changed on Sundays through his word. He wants that word to penetrate to your heart. And if you feel convicted on Sunday morning, I haven't been spying on you. I don't write a sermon the week of because I learned something new about somebody else. You can ask Ray. He's like, I need a new sermon series. Like, I already gave it to you for the next three months. I see I want another one. All right, they, they are, they're, they're, they're created way in advance. So if God is talking to your heart, it's because of his word, not because I've been spying on you or know something secret about you. His word is alive and active, and it will speak to our hearts. It does have a very profound impact on our lives, and that's why we preach from it and hear, at least hear someone preach from it every Sunday. The other thing that, uh, the other reason why we study God's word is because that's what Jesus wants for his church. I don't know if you know that, but that's what Jesus wants for his church. If, if, you're, not normal, if you're not in a, in a, in a schedule of reading your word during the week, I challenge you this week to read John 17. Just one chapter of scripture, one chapter of scripture. John 17, read that this week. Because many of us look at the Lord's Prayer as what was given in Matthew 6. But that was a model for prayer. That wasn't Jesus laying down his thoughts and attitudes for us. In John 17, we have a whole chapter of Jesus praying. He's laying his heart out to God. That's the Lord's Prayer. That's the, that, that is what we see Jesus communicating to God, and he prays for himself in that chapter. He prays for his disciples. He prays for you and me. Jesus prayed for you and me. I don't know if you knew that, but he did. He prayed for you and me. One of the things he prayed is in verse 17 of chapter 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said, look, God, I want, I want my church to be set apart. That's what sanctify means. I want my church to be holy. I want my church to, to be without sin. That only happens through the word of God. Through the word of God. That's, that's how we know how we're supposed to be set apart, how we're supposed to live. Basically, Jesus says, I want my followers to be just like me. And that only happens when we open the word. If we just base everything on feeling, on culture, on what's popular today, we're not being sanctified by God's truth. And we need to be sanctified by God's truth. God wants to communicate to you. And the primary way he does that is through his word. And that is why we spend time each Sunday Learning from it. Now, I know people want to know, why do you preach the way you preach, John? Why do you preach the way you preach? Why must you use an iPad? Why? Well, the reason I use an iPad is, is not complex. It's not deep. It's not because I think I'm awesome or whatever. But when I was preaching before using my notes, there's 10 or 12 pages of notes. Sometimes, most of the time, the notes would get jumbled up together. And it would take me quite a long time to find my place. So... I preached one time with the tablet, and that corrected that problem. That's why I use an iPad. There's nothing, anything else about it but that. And I know some people wonder, well, are you changing the words of Scripture when you're putting them on the screen? I, I, want, I want you to know that I have never asked anyone to change the words of Scripture to put on the screen. Whatever is up here, 
it will, you will find in the red pew Bibles there in front of you. They're, they're, we do not change the words that are on the screen. It's just easier for people to follow along sometimes because sometimes I'll just ramble through scripture after scripture after scripture. The other question I get is, John, why do you do so many series? What's the point of your series? Well, I think the point of my series is that uh, you guys know what's coming up, and ultimately you can invite somebody else to church. That's why we do series is for you to, to be able to invite someone else to church. And we have in the back these little cards, they're little business cards, and they're for you to take two or three and put them in your wallet, and they serve as a reminder Not for yourself, but for somebody else. So uh, if you know that next week we're talking about baptism, okay? We're talking about baptism, and someone has questions about baptism at your work, you can hand them this card. Don't flick it at them. (laughs) Be there. Hand them this card. You're on the back. You can just write, you know, we're we're, we're talking about baptism on Sunday, and we'd love for you to come. You can give that to them. That's a reminder card for them to say, hey, Later in the week, they're like, what, what church was that again? Where was this at? Oh, yeah, Westside Church of Christ, service, 10.30 a.m. I'll be sure to be there. So these are on the back table for you, and uh, we want you to take advantage of that. And that is why I do preach in series, st- strictly for the, the availability for you to know what's coming up and for uh, the possibility of outreach to your friends and your coworkers. So that's, that's, uh, that's why we do that. And in closing today, I just really want you to know that God desires to have a relationship with you, a real relationship. God does not want someone that just comes in and sits down on Sunday morning and leaves. This is, if you think this is like a special time you're visiting with God, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not just what he wants. I mean, he wants us to gather for worship. He's always desired that. But he wants a relationship the other six days of the week. If I told my wife, honey, you're going to see me one day of the week for an hour and a half, and that is it. That's all I got for it. Bob, put your arms down. Come on, Bob. (laughs) Look, now you know next week I'll be uh, doing some counseling (coughs) for sure. Um, But God desires for you to have a relationship to him. We can pray anytime, anywhere. I had a guy that was a, a, a... he was a, a businessman for Wells Fargo, and he said, John, I want to pray, but I just don't have a lot of time. I mean, my day is jam-packed. I leave the house at 6 in the morning, and every time I don't get home until 10 at night. I have meeting after meeting after meeting. I'm trying to draw a new business everywhere I go. I have no time to pray. You don't understand. I don't have time to pray. I have two kids, so when I am home early, I'm trying to, you know, play Barbie with my daughter and play Nintendo with my son. I don't have time to pray, and I looked at him, and I said, well, where are your meetings at? They're all over Los Angeles. So you get stuck in traffic a lot? All the time. How many hours are you in traffic a day? Two hours. You have two hours every day that you could be praying to the Lord. You don't have to have your eyes closed to pray. You could be having a conversation with God right there in your car. It's very important to know you're never too busy to pray. You can always find time to pray. And God's Word. God's Word is more accessible today than it's ever been. Ever. I don't carry my cell phone on me a lot, but if you have a smartphone, You have access to God's word anywhere you go. And you don't even have to be like super religious. You know, so if you've ever seen somebody that carries their Bible into work and it's one of those 10-pound Bibles and they're slamming it down. You don't have to be like that. You can can take out your smartphone and look like you're reading text messages and you can just be reading a few verses of scripture right there in the break room. You always have time to commune with God if, if that is really important to you. And he came here to rescue us, to die for us. That's how badly he wants a relationship. That's how badly he wants us to be communicating with one another, to be praying and reading his word. And I really encourage you today that if you want this message to be really impactful to your life, you do that. Be communicating with God this week. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for listening to my words today, right now as I I talk to you. And I, I just pray that everyone in here will know how badly you desire to hear from them, how badly you want them to share their hearts with you. And Father, we we can't hide anything from you. You know what's on our hearts already, God, so it's okay to share anything with you. And I pray that this week that that, that we, we will come to you with the right motives, God, and that we will seek you out, and that when we open the word, God, we'll let it penetrate our hearts, and we'll be like clay, 
and God, that you will just slowly be molding us more and more into the image of your son. And Father, I pray that just for myself, that, that, that as I approach your word, God, that I will always look at it as alive and active, and God, that it will be ever changing me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team up. We have an opportunity to to uh, have an invitation time. And I just want to say that <coughs> if you have never given your life over to the Lord, He wants that. He wants your life. He wants your heart. He paid a big price to free you from your sins by dying on the cross for us. And if you would like to come forward and accept Christ, uh, today would be a great day to do that. Will you please stand right now as we sing this invitation song? <coughs>